Wish you were one of those influencers with raving fans who binge on your every word, consume all your content, buy everything you have to sell and demand even more? Then stay tuned while Authority Magazine columnist and BuzzFeed contributor Tracy Hazard shares strategies, tips, and tactics from top videocasters, podcasters, authors, and social influencers on creating that bingeable factor. Now, let's join Tracy as she explores how to rise above all the digital noise with The Binge Factor. Hey, everyone. Welcome to The Binge Factor. And we're going to talk e-commerce. We're going to talk honest e-commerce today. I, the Honest E-Commerce Podcast with Chase Clymer. That's my guest for today. And, you know, this is coming about where we've interviewed a couple of different people in the e-commerce space. And I'm glad to see a resurgence because there used to be a lot of shows in the space and then a lot of them pod faded. And over 2019, 2020, I've started to see some more pop in. And Chase is one of those. Um, his show is one of those. It has really taken off. And the reality is, is that even though an industry might be hot, a niche might be hot, like e-commerce was really hot in 2017, you know, right around that time period. And all these podcasts would emerge in there. The ones that stick around and continue to support people after the trend, those are the ones you want to reward with your listeners you know, with listening, you want to reward them by becoming their binge listener because they know what works today and worked yesterday. And there's a comparison for that. So that's always something that I strive and look for. And so Chase has got a great podcast that is really doing that, that really looks at what it was like before and really asking the tough questions about what it's like today. It's one of my favorite questions that he asks on the air. So Chase Clymer is the co-founder at Electric Eye, where he and his team create Shopify-powered sales machines from strategic design, development, and marketing decisions. He is also the host of Honest E-Commerce, a weekly podcast where he provides online store owners with honest, actionable advice to increase their sales and grow their business. They are also on YouTube. So there's video as well in the model of things. You know, I am always interested in someone I can learn from. And this is the great part about it. With 240 episodes, I could skip around and I found some great episodes that really interested me so that I could sit here and learn something new about what was going on in the e-commerce world, not just learn all about Chase and the podcast, Honest E-Commerce. Chase, thanks for joining me. Honest E-Commerce. You know, this is what I was thinking about as I was introducing you. I was thinking that you've got the kind of podcast that people are going to come back to where they might've taken a hiatus because you have over 240 episodes. So, you know, wow, congratulations, great job. But when you have that many episodes, some of your longtime listeners fade just because that's like, they're like, yeah, I got this. I'm in control. I, I'm doing well. I'm fine. Mm -hmm. But so much is going on in the e-commerce area that's not working this is the time for them to come back. And I think you're going to start seeing spikes in your show again. Absolutely. I think that uh, it's funny with the downloads. It gets really cyclical every year. Uh, there's definitely, um, as we head into Q4, which is obviously giant for retail, it just goes woo every year. But what's just cool is like, it sticks around a bit. So they, there definitely is like a roller coaster every year where it goes up towards kind of when everything, when retail is more top of mind for merchants and like, you know, what should I be doing before Q4 hits? Yeah. Yeah. What should I be doing? And what should I do be doing? Because uh, Facebook ads aren't working. And yeah, yeah. That's the like, advice you know, is start whatever you're doing back in Q2 and your agency would like you a lot more. <laughs> <laughs> they would. <laughs> you know what? That, that's, but that's such good advice. And so that's one of the things that I say to a lot of our sports podcasters and other things like that is that what they don't realize is how important the opposite of their season is. So they think, yeah. okay, I want to be podcasting during the season. But the reality is, is that everyone has more time in the off season and they're looking for something. So we have to be thinking about those timeframes. And so I used to do, um, when I was doing my product launch hazards podcast, I would do the, um, May, June timeframe. We would talk about the forecast for the next year. Mm -hmm. which seems crazy, but if you don't start planning your new color development, your new product development in that, at that timing, you're already probably too late. Like you should be at color final selection by then, but you know, that's the way I would have been, but 
in that e-commerce world, you can go a little bit longer. And so that's when I would give that advice. And so I'd give the new trend and color forecast in May and June of each year for the following January's forecast. Absolutely. No, it, it makes complete sense because uh, un- unfortunately, you know, a lot of small entrepreneurs, merchants, et cetera, they're, they're wearing too many hats. So they're like trying. So when it does get into the busy season, they don't have the time to really like, do execute on any of this stuff. And then in Q1, they're kind of like just recovering from the, the, the craziness that is Black Friday and Cyber Monday and just the holiday sales season. And we, I try to at least be like, hey, spend this time like planning what you're going to be doing. Um, I should get a little more uh, specific about that and like plan my episodes a bit better because I have so many in the can recorded at all times. So like I'll be talking about things like right after a holiday and it won't come out for two months. And so I guess I'll get a little bit better at that. <laughs> yeah. You might have to like delay, but you know, in, in this case, it's also maybe a good idea to do, to do. And I, I don't like replays. They go really badly with your subscriber base. And I, mm-hmm. I know from having done replays on a show, but that's no reason to not remind them of episodes. And so, yeah. you know, to do an episode at the holiday time, that's just a drop in really quick five minute that says, Hey, don't forget, we have these episodes from last year, which are going to really inform you about what you need to be thinking about this Ooh, year. That's a good idea. Yeah. I think that would be really useful for a show like yours. That is so cyclical in its nature of what, you know, these things come up again and again. And while you want to be talking about them new, you do also want to reference them to the framework of the old. Yeah. Yeah. And so, um, you know, that's where I love what we do at Podetize. We have multi feeds. So I'll do the, uh, uh, like a whole feed that's just for, you know, you could do a whole feed that's just for Q4. <laughs> you know, just for Q4 topics. Yeah. Curate some specific lists. Yeah. yeah that's, a, that's a great idea. Yeah. We you do know. a lot of one oh ones. you know, for the basics, like if, cause if you, once you get over a hundred episodes, it's too hard for someone to find their basics. Right. Mm-hmm. So yeah. And getting started. especially just the types of interviews that I have, it's definitely when I started was a certain, I think most podcasters when they start is anyone that will come on your show is a guest, <laughs> but now I'm a little more, uh, specific about the type of interview I want to do. And it's mostly, I want to tell like a merchant story and I want to interview someone because I've done that interview a hundred times, way more than a hundred times probably, but I know what they're going to say before I even ask the question half the time. And I do it to paint a narrative that is like, it's hard work. And this, these are the things you have to do, do things that don't scale in the beginning um, just to help other merchants that are a few steps behind them. Like maybe they'll hear the one thing that they're stuck on to really get them to that next step. I love that you do that. And I think that's actually your binge factor right there. It's that you're, and it's an unusual place, but because you have so much experience in this world Mm -hmm. of e-commerce and the people that you're bringing on have walked the path already, you're able to dive in and like just hit on that single point that your audience needs to hear. And I love that what you do is you actually say, did you hear what he said or she said, yeah. this is what we've been talking about, about how hard this is or about how much more difficult this is to be starting a, you know, an e-commerce brand in 2022. I've heard you say that multiple times on different episodes and because it's true. It's the same thing with podcasting, right? It's so much harder to start today. Now, when did you start your show? Um, I had a friend of mine push me into doing it, Annette. So if you listen to some of the first earlier episodes, Annette, and then our project manager, Andrew, we were like, Hey, you, you can get, you can talk to anybody really. Uh, you should do a podcast cause you just hate writing. And I was like, yeah, all right, whatever. <laughs> um, so I, I tried it and he got my sea legs going on it and, and kind of figured it out. Um, and then when I started to take it more seriously is when Annette and I parted ways, we're still on great terms. And I'm going to get Tracy to have a net on because her new podcast is wild. Oh, I huge. can't wait. Yeah. So you'll, you'll check out what she's doing in the Airbnb world. Um, but uh, yeah, so like once I started taking it seriously and I started to realize the kind of the cool things you could do with podcasting outside of just creating content, uh, it, it was a lot of fun. And then honestly, uh, I just got good because I just kept doing it. And I guess good to my, my, I think I'm good at it just because I can have a conversation and I know the questions to ask, but maybe if you put me on a different interview show where it was something out of my depth, I wouldn't know what I was doing. No, no. I think that, that, you know, when you were looking at somebody's binge factor, it's like, Chase is going to be my guide. 
that's a binge factor right there. You're yeah. going to be my guide to give me what I need here because every show, there's all these interview shows out there and they're going to go into the backstory and they're going to, you know, and they're going to be the story-based telling. But when I'm trying to really learn something, I'm trying to get that takeaway and you're not going to let me miss it. Mm -hmm. That's a binge factor in and of itself. And that's why I think people will come back again and again and again and listen to your show. And because you have over 240 episodes, you've certainly earned the right to have them say, okay, I've, I'm new to this world. Who am I going to pick? Yeah. And they're going to pick you because I hope of so. That. Yeah. During the, during the pandemic, I just doubled down on content. So I was putting two a week out during the pandemic. Uh, but yeah, to answer your original question, it started at uh, January, 2000 and I want to say 19. So going into three years here and released one every week, I think I maybe missed one or two weeks just because it fell during a holiday or something. Um, but we've been pretty specific about it. Now I've got an awesome uh, team that helps me, two VAs, uh, helps me get the content out. Um, and, you know, the show itself has definitely evolved uh, to, you know, I, I think the binge, binge worthy, binge factor of it is purposeful. I think that merchants are busy and I like really like to call out the, those golden nuggets as you will. Cause there's only going to be a couple of them in each episode, but when you put it behind the narrative of trying to present like a, a, a business's growth as kind of the hero's journey, which is what I do in the back of my head when I'm having all these interviews, um, you know, I think that's cool. So people can kind of crush one out like on their subway ride to work or in a car or whatnot. Um, I think that, you know, business podcasts, like, I think they get a little long in the tooth sometimes. And, and it's like, no one, no one cares. They don't want to hear a three hour thing. They like kind of just want to like get, get those nuggets and like have it be in a, a little more palatable form. Yeah. That's what I was wondering. I was wondering if you're sort of thinking about a shorter format. I mean, TikTok's really shifted what? things. And I was wondering if you're thinking about that. Uh, I don't know shorter per se, but it, they've historically gotten shorter. So uh, they were more, they were around like 45 to an hour when I first started. And then now I actually just in the last two weeks, I changed the length of my Calendly invite to 30 minutes. So I get it done in under 30 minutes. Uh, to force myself to be a little more specific about it. I also don't like when podcasts kind of, they kind of neander at the end. And I like to end with people wanting more. Mm, interesting strategy. I like that. So let's talk a little bit about, you know, how you got started. Did, mm -hmm. you know, it's like launching a brand, right? <laughs> and I know, you know, a lot about launching a product. So do I. So that's why when I, when I approached my podcast, so what did you find as the most, you know, difficult part for you launching your podcast? I think, uh, to be honest, the most difficult part was big, being comfortable with it, uh, getting comfortable on the mic, getting comfortable on camera. Um, ours is vi ours is video as well. Um, but I think, you know, I th a lot of, uh, entrepreneurs kind of get stuck in the choices. Like what mic do I need? What software do it? None of it matters. <laughs> you know, what matters is just getting in the rhythm of producing the content on like whatever cadence that you're doing it. Finding guests to interview was honestly, not that hard. I had a million partnerships or, or uh, contemporaries in the space to reach out to and be like, Hey, I'm starting this thing. Would you want to be on it? Um, and honestly, they never say no, right? <laughs> they never no, Cause you're leading with value, right? So when you evolve and you get further onto it and you want to get to more specific guests, like yesterday I interviewed the CMO of smile direct club, right? I never thought I'd do that three years ago, but it's pretty easy once you know how to spin the game and like lead with value and, and play PR agencies at this point. So it, it's, it, I don't think any of it was hard. It was more just getting started, just like going from zero to one was the really difficult thing. Yeah. Yeah. It, it is for a lot of people, the difficult things. Well, you've, you know, certainly mastered that you've come a long way on it. Let's talk about your three things because I'm sure you have, and you kind of just hinted to it. The one that I want to hear. So I ask everyone how they get great guests, but you've kind of talked about that already, but I, you said something about play PR agencies. I want to know what play means. <laughs> uh, I'm just a little, uh, I'm a goofy guy. I don't know. I don't play them, but basically I, I learned, uh, you know, if you have a podcast, you're in, you have an email address that's just openly out there and you're going to get people submitting themselves. If you have any sort of like actual downloads on your podcast. And when you hit a certain threshold, PR agencies will reach out, right? And I, ignore, I usually would just say no when it wasn't a good fit. And I, but now I'm like, hey, this guy isn't a good, or gal isn't a good fit for these reasons, but this is what I'm looking for. And then they go, great, like F that guy, here's 10 people that might be a good fit for you. And you can kind of pick and choose and do what you want there. 
And then also within your, uh, I have an onboarding form before every guest. And so do you, uh, before every best guest gets on the podcast in that form, I say, who else should I interview? Who do you want to introduce me to? So then like, it's just, you know, uh, five degrees of Charlie Sheen or whatever it is, like you're going to end up interviewing. Oh my gosh. So you must people. be like next generation because I think it was Kevin Bacon in my day. Kevin Bacon, so. maybe. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I never heard, I know, I've yeah. heard the other version. <laughs> I mean, it's probably wrong. Um, uh, but no, 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 that one's worked out really well. And then actually, um, I, I did some like, this one is like the more advanced one that I started doing a lot more recently, which is I actually had a VA for a while helping me scrape. And like, I had a ideal guest avatar I put together and they would, and then we had some, uh, lead generation files that we purchased and then scraped and then found the correct contact information for the exact target people I wanted to interview and did cold email out outreach campaigns to get more specific, like store founders that I wanted to interview as well. Um, and that's why, you know, I kind of alluded to earlier that I've shifted away from really doing subject matter expert interviews or interviewing kind of like uh, apps in the ecosystem and really kind of narrowed in on telling that that founder's story because uh, it's a lot more fun, um, but also- But it's a lot more real path for the listeners. So it's more yes. matched to them. And then let's not like lie. The podcast is a business tool and my agency helps Shopify store brands and founders grow their sales. So the easiest way to have an like organic conversation with our ideal client is by interviewing them on the podcast. Right. So you've got a guest funnel going. Yes. Yeah. So do I. Right. And this is it. This is the model. This, this of my eight podcasts is the model for a guest funnel. And so, you know, I love that you're like really straightforward about it. That's, you know, honest e commerce. Like, the, you know, let's be really straight with it. But when you're talking with those agencies, you know, are you really straight with them? It's like, hey, I'm not going to just have anyone on the show. Like, how, how straightforward are you with them? Uh, I'm pretty specific. I'm like, Hey, I'm looking for, you know, founder or, well, so for example, like with smile direct club, we're not going to work with smile direct club. They're not even the tech stack that we use, but that's a cool name that I want on the podcast. That's going to get some more listeners to come you want in. some authority with that. Yeah. Yeah. So that that's one example, but you know, uh, when I'm reaching out to some of these other PR companies, I can like, they'll send me a list of people and I'll like, I'll look and see like, Oh, like they're, I can make some guesstimates about their size, like what they're doing, where they're, like kind of weak points would be and be like, they'd probably be a really good, you know, a agency client. So they'd probably make an easy, an okay podcast guest. Um, and, and I'll kind of like, you know, select them in, in that regard too. Um, but at this point I set aside four time slots a week to record the podcast, just because it's like, I like to meet new people to try to keep our funnel going. Um, so as long as they kind of hit them, some of the criteria that I'm looking for, I'll, uh, I'll have a conversation with anybody. So that's why you're recorded so far ahead. Cause you got four slots a week. <laughs> well, and I, I want to go on, two, a, I wanna I, go I on a, a very long vacation. <laughs> some right. might call it a sabbatical. <laughs> <laughs> so you're planning ahead. Yeah. <laughs> I love it. So listeners, increasing listeners is the hardest thing. I get every single podcaster that I talk about. And I'm like, they're like, I'm not as successful as I'd like to be here. This is the area, but what are you doing to increase listeners and grow engagement with them? Absolutely. Uh, first and foremost is, uh, release content on like a expected cadence. So we've released an episode every Monday for the past three years. Um, and you can see the trend line. It's, it's always going up. Um, so there's that, but this took me a, a little bit longer to realize than I, I should have, which was, um, other people have bigger audiences than you. So go on other podcasts and talk about your podcast and you'll get more listeners. So we really, uh, leaned in heavy into that probably six months to a year ago. Um, and that's definitely helped, uh, kind of kick up the, the thing there. And then, uh, through partnerships and doing bonus episodes, with other people in my industry. So now I, I kind of said earlier, I don't really do as many uh, interviews with apps or, or subject matter experts, but now I'm starting to add bonus episodes in to which increase the downloads. And then also now the partners and whatnot are, are sharing those with their network, which will hopefully bring back more listeners to the show as well. Yeah. So let's talk monetization. You've got ads in your show, you've got your own ads. And I, and I hear some that I think are maybe associated or partners of some kind, mm -hmm. but I'm not sure. Are they straight sponsors or are they partners? Um, all the sponsorships are pretty 
basically every sponsor of the show is a very strong partner of our agency. Um, so you so have experience modern... with them. So when you're recommending yeah, them, it's yeah. not like we're, distant. we're, we're recommending, like we're using these products a lot within our, our, our builds or retainers, or whatever the heck we're doing. Um, but yeah, so it, they're very good partners of, with ours. So like when I'm, when I'm doing a sponsorship, cause we're in such a very niche field, I can charge rates that like someone in a more broad category probably couldn't because like, I know for a fact, who's listening to my show is who you want to use your product. Whereas something that's a little more broad, you couldn't get the, the, same levels for the investment. Um, but I want to make it valuable to them. So I spice it up a little bit. Like we do some co-marketing stuff. Like we do some email trading as well. Like I want to make sure that they're getting the value out of it as well. Cause I want a long-term partnership. I don't just want like a quick win. Oh, I so agree. We do. We usually do blog, email, and uh, social, of course, as a mm. part of the pot of sponsorship packages when we do. Yeah, we do. Uh, we want to do like a webinar every quarter. We'll do like uh, some blog trading. So that's great. So it's a deeper partnership. It's a deeper sponsorship. And, and that's a great association. Yeah. And you actually, know what I can return they're getting. Yeah. And I can share a bit more. So with all of them, obviously we do the video and, and the audio and it's like, you can give me a script, I'll record it, or you can give me stuff and we'll edit it together to make it better. And then I like push them all to be like, make a landing page with my face on it with a quote, give me a custom, you know, honesty commerce coupon code. And I'm like, do all these things to make the message and the, it, like to make it more seamless. Cause I want them to get the click throughs and I want them to get, you know, the money and the return for their investment. Well, you know, I'm really interested to hear how the podcast itself, you know, in addition to the sponsorship dollars, which are bringing monetization in, which is helping to cover the cost of the show, but what's translating into like, you know, what's that kind of conversion rate for you from the guests and the audience in terms of clients? Yeah, that's a great question. I would say with this type of outreach, not everybody is buying at all times. So, right. You're looking at a less than 10% of people that are even probably looking for something. And then it's probably like whatever your close rate is at your agency. So I would say out of every, you know, 10 episodes that I record, you know, there's a decent chance that the conversation might continue on to some sort of engagement. Um, and a lot of people are, you know, okay with whomever they're currently working with, or it's not the right time for them. I've had people come back kind of months down the line be like, Hey, we talked about that one thing. Like it's still, you know, a problem. Um, but it's definitely a numbers game, just like any sort of outreach strategy. So, you know, just cause the first couple don't work out doesn't mean it's not going to work. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, that's, I think that's this probably the same case here as the, you know, when we look back on, you know, last year, for instance, and I only have four guests a month, so it's not like it's a lot. Mm -hmm. Um, but when we looked back at it, it was just, it wasn't just the monetization of those guests. It was that those guests referred other people to us. So even if yep. they didn't come on, they referred people to us because of the relationship that we built on air. And that's been really useful. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I think that um, as a, as typically a, as a marketing investment content creation is regardless of how you're doing it, it's definitely a profitable channel for our agency. That's really good. How are you repurposing the podcast? All right. So the podcast is on audio through all the normal thingies. And then it, we also have it on YouTube now. Um, we use um, a software. I don't know if you want shout outs on the software. Oh, go right use. ahead. People want to know uh, what you're using. I am a huge, huge fan of Riverside.fm. Mm -hmm. So we use it for all of our content creation uh, beyond the podcast. But like, it's, it's super fun to do that for like two party recordings and whatnot or up to four and screen share, to be honest. But um, so that, that one's awesome to use to help create the content. So then it ends up on YouTube. And then we have um, the blog where there's a kind of like a quick synopsis and then it's transcribed as well for the SEO content and the you know podcast player and the video end up there. Then we have a newsletter where we push out each episode every week. And then we're kind of pushing it all through the socials. We used to get a little more... Um, granular with how we did the distribution and cutting stuff up a bit more. And we did some split testing and it kind of got the same results to do less work. So we kind of stopped doing more. Right. Right. Um, that's interesting that you stopped doing more on, on which things did you decide to, to cut? Um, just because I think it's because with, with our, our niche and like the organic reach of the content, doing short form stuff and pushing it out through say like Facebook and Twitter and Instagram uh, and LinkedIn um, just 
wasn't really pushing the needle on total downloads for the full form content. That's an interesting, uh, in an interesting, uh, observation of how you, you know, how your client base is. I think yeah. that's probably similar to mine. I mean, usually the short based content does drive subscribers, but the long content drives clients. So it's yeah. just, you know, so I really think it's just a little bit different as to what they're looking for. Absolutely. And I just think it's just the, the niche nature of, of our audience and the content that we're putting out. Yeah. Like, absolutely. I don't think that many people that follow me on some of these social networks even know what my job is. So uh, there's a lot of people who want to sell their stuff. They are merchants, yeah. right? They want to sell their stuff. They're using their podcast. What have you found to be some of the best ways to do affiliate links, to sell uh, products from podcasts? Have you found any tactics that work? Oh, that's a fantastic question. Um, I would, I, I would say uh, going back to what I kind of said with what I like to do with our sponsors is like, make sure that like whatever the coupon code is or whatever you're telling them to do the call to action is easy as easy as possible uh like uh, we used to have a a sponsor where the url we were sending them to was like really confusing and i, was <laughs> I like, heard this one that you were spelling out and i was like um oh that's dsrm.io <laughs> slash something right <laughs> um and i'm like guys stop it no like this i was like what can we do to just make this your website slash our podcast like that's what it needs to be and so uh they actually we changed it recently and and got that kind of solved have you um, thought about doing it the other way doing like a forwarding url oh man i didn't so it would could. be honestycommerce.com <laughs> because everybody knows that they're already there they're your yeah. listener forward slash whatever you know you want it you you want to send them to some of my clients have a single page. So we create a single page for them mm-hmm. where it's, you know, honest e-commerce forward slash, you know, sponsors, sponsors. and it's got all the offers and it's there. got everybody there and you can just click out. So then it's just easy to change up. And so there's still only one URL for your audience to, to remember. Yeah. See, this is why you go on podcasts, people. You so learn you, stuff. <laughs> you're like, wait, I can simplify this. <laughs> yeah. No, that's a fantastic idea. Um, but yeah, just making that, making that call to action very easy and straightforward. Um, and then wherever they end up like having your, you know, your face or your art or whatever there. So the marketing message is matched. So they like, are like, yeah, this is why I'm here. This is the thing I'm doing. Um, that's, I love that. I think that's a really smart tactic. That's a marketing trick or like a landing page trick from paid advertising that I brought over into this, this world. It's just like, cause like what you'll see oftentimes is people will have like really, really cool, like on Facebook ads, they'll have like a really cool video or whatever. It's like in a certain style or whatever. And then people will click on it and they'll land on like a collection page where they don't even see that product. And then like, it's a completely different vibe and they feel like they went to the wrong place and then they just go back and they don't continue forward with whatever they were doing. So whenever you're doing any sort of marketing, you want the, whatever is taking them there to continue upon the page. So they realize they're in the right place. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, great tips. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. Really appreciate that, Chase. The other, th- the last thing I kind of want to talk about before I get to your, you know, your final comments, <laughs> is is really just looking at the podcasting world itself and the future of it. it it's with everything that's changing with the iOS, with Facebook ads not working, email being harder and harder, are you starting to see more people flood into podcasting because of that? And if so, what's your game plan for your clients and for others with that? Yeah, uh, I think that every tech like app in my ecosystem is launching a podcast or has launched a podcast. <laughs> Yeah. Um, and you know what, the more the merrier, I don't, you know, they're, they'll, they'll either produce some really cool content and it'll be fun. And then I can go be a guest on their show or they'll realize it's a lot of work and they'll kind of give up. And I, I think that, uh, we legacy is not the right term, but we've been doing it long enough to where it's like, all right, we've got episodes. This is a real thing. People are, and I think that's like, oftentimes what people are looking for is like, how many episodes does this thing have? When is the last time they actually released something? Like if I'm going to subscribe to some new stuff organically i want to make sure that like i don't get sucked into some world that's not going to exist anytime soon um but yeah i mean to stand out it's just i i like the kind of the stories that i'm telling you know the those merchant journeys over kind of like with the the hero's journey kind of as the backdrop 
it's fun for me. And I, I think that the audience is resonating with it. So I'm just going to kind of double down on what's working. Uh, good. So you're, you're going to stay all in with podcasting. Yeah. Do you have any advice for aspiring podcasters or existing podcasters who are, you know, churning it out, but having difficulties? Uh, well, number one, I said this earlier, the hardest thing is to just get going. So if you're thinking about it, just do it. Uh, it, you know, that's the hardest part of anything, starting a business or, you know, going out on your own and freelancing. If you want to think about leaving the corporate job, it's like, just do it. Cause the, you know, the, the worst thing that could happen is it didn't work out. You know what I mean? But the, the thought of not knowing if it could is always going to eat at the back of your mind. So just do it. Um, other than that, I mean, you don't even need a cool mic to get started. You don't need a cool camera. You can use your iPhone. I know some people that are doing that to, to, to diverse content. Um, and once you kind of find your voice and find the story you want to tell and, and find the types of people you want to interview, maybe then start to invest in some core tools. Yeah, absolutely. Well, Chase, so glad you came on the show. So glad we got to meet each other. Honesty Commerce, such a great show, going to be more and more valuable. I, I really want you to report back to me. Send me a, a tweet message somewhere telling me that your, your listener spiked because I guarantee you it's about to happen in the next couple of months. Awesome. I will let you know. There was so much to unpack there. He was dropping little bits of things and I was trying to make sure that I didn't miss any. I love that with the PR agency tip and you know just ways that they're using uh, video, the fact that they've learned that long tail works better for their client connection. So you know, this is something that I think that we don't spend enough time on as podcasters is that getting to know our, our listener. And it, I know it's hard because you don't have your listeners. But when you've created a podcast where those listeners are going to reach out to you, um, where the guests are your clients and some of the listeners are your clients, you have a good idea of who you're targeting, who's likely to be the right people. And you can start to ask the right questions and get to this greater understanding of that audience base and then dive deeper as Chase is doing, right? Dive deeper into that space where you're feeling success, comfort, and you're also feeling like you're on the edge and you're learning because if you're learning in the space, then that means your clients and your listeners are learning as well. And that's where, you know, Chase is kind of when he, when he asks his questions, when he's diving deep into that hero story, he's getting at the thing that he wants to know too, right? So he's curating that for his audience and for himself, which keeps you engaged in your podcast. This is how you keep going and don't pod fade. You keep it being valuable to your business, to who you are, to what you're bringing to the world and to those out there listening and guesting on your show. So Honesty Commerce, go check out their site, Honesty Commerce. Um, you can go to the blog post for this episode at thebenchfactor.com and get straight there. Electric Eye is also, if you're looking for an agency in the e-commerce space, Electric Eye is out there too. Um, you want to go to Electric Eye as well. And we'll have both of those linked in the blog post for this episode. So you'll be able to get right there, you know, and really check out how he's doing ads. Now, the ad section is about five minutes. So it's extra long. And I don't always recommend that. But in his particular space, I think you can probably get away with it. Um, and, you know, you know, maybe thinking about mixing it up more and using them on different shows when you have 240, you can do that might be a better strategy, but when, but listen to those ads because the way that he's doing them, add that personal touch, add that in the no information. So he's definitely adjusting and creating ads that are more relevant to his audience. So you definitely want to listen for that as well. You know, there's always something new out there. He, he was, Chase was so gracious and, inter, and referred me to one of the podcasters he mentioned on the show. You know, that's so wonderful when you can get another guest right out of the gate before you end your episode altogether. So, you know, don't forget to ask for that. That was another great tip that Chase shared with us. So Chase Clymer, the Honesty Commerce podcast, don't miss it. And as always, go back to the bingefactor.com, check out all of the resources that we would provide for you and all of the connections so you can connect with wonderful podcasts like Chase's and connect with them and learn from their shows, especially if you're in that niche in space. So thanks everyone for listening. I'm Tracy Hazard, and I'll be back next time with another bingeable podcast host. You've been listening to the Binge Factor Podcast. For more information on podcasting and video casting success tips and tactics, please go to thebingefactor.com. 
And be sure to listen to our other show for podcasters called Feed Your Brand. If you'd like to be interviewed on this show, as well as featured in Tracy's column, please go to thebingefactor.com slash guest and apply. 